very much on more polite introduction. So as mentioned, my name is Michal Cifra, but you are correcting Italian pronunciation. <laughs> and Cifra would be. Uh, and I come from uh, Prague, Czech Republic. Um, this is the biodynamics research team that which I lead. We are a bunch of people from different backgrounds, mostly from microwave and optical engineering, but also we are biophysicists and physical chemists. Why we do what we do? We believe that the electromagnetic technologies will revolutionize medicine and biology. Sooner or later, it's already taking place, but I think we are only at the beginning. Uh, the mission of our team is to develop appropriate tools to probe and influence biosystems using electromagnetic fields. And we want to get the, the understanding of a smaller scale, so the molecular and nanoscale. Our vision of how we fulfill our long-term mission is we are currently focusing on three uh, pillars that's using advanced electromagnetic tools, using micro nanotechnology enabled tools and computational methods, all for the sake for have future biotechnology and medicine more gentle and more efficient. From scientific perspective, this is the scientific uh, path we are taking. We are starting to be strong in the theory. We are asking the questions how electromagnetic fields interact and affects organisms. That's what we call passive electromagnetic properties. And also we're asking questions how electromagnetic field is generated by organisms during their metabolic activity. That's what we call active electromagnetic properties. <coughs> After having prediction from the theories, we developed specific tools to verify the theories, mostly based on electromagnetic design, micro and nanotechnology, technology, which I mentioned. We also build the whole platforms. And then we test our theories and hypotheses mostly on the molecular and solar level. Today I will speak about four selected pieces of the story of our research. And these are these. We are, I will partly discuss the passive electromagnetic properties and the active electromagnetic properties of biosystems. So I'll start with the rather new topic which we are following, and that's we are trying to understand the complex electric permittivity of biomolecular solution. What is complex? Well, what is complex permittivity? For those who are non physicists, is the very important quantity which describes how electric component electromagnetic field interacts with the biological system, well, including with the material as such, including biological systems. So why do we need to understand complex permittivity? Um, because it's absolutely necessary for development of novel electromagnetic therapeutic and diagnostic methods. Without knowledge of the complex permittivity, we can hardly do a good design of the device. Operational design, I mean. So the first step, I will brief, briefly describe the uh, computational tools to predict and interpret complex permittivity. Um, so, uh, how we can, by approximation at first, understand the complex permittivity. So, you, you already heard that there are some models which describe the complex permittivity. The simplest one is uh, models which are based on the Debye terms. This works very nicely in the area of frequency and microwave, although it's not complete description, especially when you go higher to the frequencies. So, and in this model, um, you can see the mathematics, this is the graph, you can see the frequency, the real imaginary part of the complex permittivity here, for example, for simple plain water. This is a simple model. Um, when we add additional biomolecules, so the simplest components of the organisms to the, to the system, if the biomolecules are, well, this typically they are larger than the water, if they are still small enough, like amino acids, you would get additional dispersion term additionally to the water. So basically, in this equation, there are, for each term, there are two important uh, parameters. How to predict these important parameters? To have an understanding and prediction of the complex permittivity before you even try to measure that, to have a hypothesis or theory to test. So uh, there are already for almost 100 years from Debye and from other scientists, uh, uh, there are simple analytic equations which assume certain, um, certain properties. And based on that, we can have an at least approximate understanding what are the time scales of dispersion of the, of, the, of the complex permittivity, the time scales of the dancing of the biomolecules, if you wish, the molecules, and what is the contribution to polarizability, to the permittivity. However, this is very limited analytical perspective. Um, these equations will immediately start to fail as long as we will increase the complexity of the biological system. So it's not just simple molecules, but many molecules, larger molecules, different types of molecules, multi-component species, 
and also in, when they are increasing the contrast station of the bar molecules. And if we go to higher frequencies where the DBI model will start to fail. So we need to have better tools how to predict electromagnetic properties of biological systems. Here it is the complex permittivity I'm speaking about. Um, there is one way how to do it, at least with the classical methods. We can, what we, are, we recently pioneered is the molecular dynamic simulations. It basically uh, describes um, by Newton equations, so it's classical physics here, but good enough at uh, the first step. And basically describes movement of every atom in the, our simulation by Newton equation, which we integrate and basically we can follow the trajectory of every atom. And this, in the end, will turn, we can calculate the electromagnetic properties based on that. So it is a very powerful method because uh, it's really reliable in the sense that it's widely used, so there's a lot of references to, to work on because it's widely used in the biophysics and chemistry. And it enables the understanding of how uh, microscopic dielectric properties arise from the molecular structure and dynamics, and also it helps us to understand how the electromagnetic field affects biological systems at the molecular level. So to predict complex permittivity, we uh, published this procedure. Here is a simple example. Let's imagine we have solutions with three different concentrations of alanine, of the small amino acid. So basically, we have the simulation, which is just the visualization. You can see the water flicturing and also alanine molecules, and this arrow is the dipole moment of the alanine component. So basically what we do, we run, uh, we repeat the simulations many times to sample the phase, phase space, then what we did, we followed the dipole moment uh, autocorrelation function and cross-correlation functions, and that's what you can see plotted here. And directly from the out dipole moment autocorrelation function, we can calculate the susceptibility, which brings us to the per immediately to the permittivity. So from the molecular structure and dynamics, we are getting the measurable macroscopic quantity. This is quite powerful to connect microscopic and micros microscopic and macroscopic work. Why I consider this, for me, was mostly surprising, and why I consider it to be a very powerful method is because we can f see how not the individual components only, that means water, bio water molecules and biomolecules contribute to the complex permittivity, but also how the interaction and correlations contribute. This is where something very important. For example, here is the real part of the permittivity, like, well, at the frequency, at the microwave frequency, the imaginary part, um, actually this is the susceptibility, but here it's okay to describe like that. And what you can see that when we increase concentration of the biomolecule here, alanine, we see that uh, it is not only, as I mentioned, water and alanine contributions which, uh, which bring up the, the final permittivity, but also it is the interaction uh, the, due to the cross-correlation of the water molecules dynamics and the biomolecule dynamics, which starts to be more important when we are reaching higher concentrations, the concentrations which are uh, present in the cell, for example. Um, now I will briefly describe the experimental tools which we developed to probe complex permittivity and why we need them, the new tools. Often we are working with the isolated expensive biomolecules like isolated proteins and for those we have them, they are very expensive to work with so we need to have a method which are, the commercial methods do not enable us to measure uh, complex permittivity of very small samples. So we developed our own the tools which are mostly based on the planar devices we will develop um, various kind of resonant devices where you can probe complex permittivity at certain frequency points. So far, these are all designed up to most 50 or 60 gigahertz, so in the microwave, millimeter wave band. We also developed the uh, broadband devices, which are also able to measure the complex permittivity from small droplets. And when I will come, I can now just briefly focus on how this chip performed, was published recently. Um, so here you can see the measurement and molecular dynamics prediction from the, uh, of, the, of the simple biomolecular solutions, water and three different concentrations of alanine. And here you can, you can see the three lines. So the full line is this reference bulk measurement, which takes a lot of, a rather big sample, uh, almost um, at least five milliliters, which is big for our, for our standards. Then you can see the performance of uh, our chip, which is, has very nice agreement. You can see the error between the bulk reference measurement and our small volume measurement chip here. Also, we can see how the molecular dynamics perform. It doesn't fully, uh, exactly um, follow the experimental data. However, it semi-quantitatively reproduces the phenomena which we see in the experiment. So we have at least some trust to the molecular, the classical molecular dynamics because it helps us to understand what's happening in our sample. So the match is quite reasonable. Now I will focus on how we can 
uh, also we use molecular dynamics to understand electrical uh, effects, electrical field effects on tuplin. So at first let's start, what is a tuplin? This is our favorite biomolecule to work with because it's really fascinating. And the reasons for that are biological and biophysical. Tuplin is basically uh, it's a very interesting protein because it self-assembles to structures called microtubules. And these are structures which are present in every cell. You would, you're, you would not know the life as you know if these are microtubules. Microtubules enable cells to divide, so they are very important, at least based on this reason. And also very important for the intercellular tra transport. So the protein looks like this, this is the dimension, it self-assembles to the microtubules, provided that the, there is uh, energy in the form of GTP. And microtubules in the cell, if you have a static view, there are many, many hundred hundreds of microtubules per cell, depends on cell type. They are also dynamic. You can see in the fluorescent microscopy how the microtubules grow and shrink. So this is the model how microtubules grow and shrink. So they polymerize and depolymerize. So this is fascinating because they are themselves non-equilibrial structures. They grow and shrink, and this is interesting because this non-equilibricity brings about a sensitivity as well to external perturbations. So what we, why all the tubulin is interesting, tubulin, when you compare to all other proteins, is electrically special. When we plotted uh, the charge, well, the distribution of the electric charge on, a, on the protein through all protein database. So we, basically we took 12,000 proteins and we plotted the charge, and we also plotted the charge for the tubulin family only. Here the message is, you can see that the tubulin charge is much higher than the charge of the other proteins. The same is the case for the dipole moment. Interestingly, the dipole moment of the proteins from the tubulin family is three to four times higher than the dipole moment of the average protein. Why this is important? Because it brings about higher sensitivity of tubulin to the electromagnetic field, especially to the electric component. Uh, so we made use of this fact and we focus on our, in our research on tubulin uh, properties. So I apologize, we don't, do not plot water here, but we will we'll have to do analysis on the plot later. But all our simulations, of course, are present with the water molecules. So this is the structure of the tubulin which we used. These are the conditions which we used. We asked the question, can we use very short electric pulses, just on the order of few nanoseconds? They do not heat at all. They just act by the electrical force. Can we use them to affect tubulin? conformation and tubulin function. So this is the uh, time scales of the computational experiment, which should correspond to the uh, real experiments which we, we are performing now. This is the electric field strength, which we used. So the result, in short, I skipped many details, but just to give you a message, we found that in a, if there is no field present, there is only thermal motion of the tubulin in the simulation. However, if when we switch on the field, only for 10 nanoseconds, even if it is, this is still below the threshold of the electrical breakdown, so this is experimentally achievable. Within a few nanoseconds, tubulin dipole will align with the field. Makes sense. The same like magnetic dipoles align the magnetic field. When we increase the field strength, it's not only very short alignment of the electric of the dipole of the electric or the tubulin of the electric external electric field. It's also the change of the structure. You can see that the C terminus of the tubulin is pulled out from the from the uh, from the tubulin body. So we can. The message is here that. The experimentally attainable, very short, intense electric pulses can affect tubulin conformation in a more strong way than they affect other proteins because tubulin has a special electrical properties. Now I will go through the, our past research on the active electromagnetic properties of bar systems. Here, what we mean is we are, we are asking questions do organisms generate electromagnetic field? And if how, what is the mechanism? What is this frequency range? Um, when you go to this very interesting and exciting um, part of research, and you do the, uh, we, are, we are looking on what is known currently about the electrodynamic activity of the, of the living cells, you will find out that so far what is very well known is electrical activity of the special organs in uh, higher organisms. For example, you very know, you very know the activity, the electric activity in the human brain, in the heart, and other tissues which are electroexcitable. Frequency-wise, this is maximum what you get when you do spectral analysis is the activity up to a few tens of kilohertz maximum. So this is rather low frequency from the electromagnetic perspective. Then we know on the other part of the electromagnetic spectrum, I don't go to the, the ionizing, to just stick to the, uh, to the light and the top. We know that certain organisms emit light. This is called bioluminescence. So this is also well known. What is a little bit less known, that actually 
all organisms emit weak light, which I will speak about in a few minutes. Then, however, when from the electromagnetic perspective, me as an electromagnetic engineer, I like to see the spectrum. There is a large gap, at least when you go to the decades, where there is almost little known, or there are just some hypotheses. This is what we focus on, I focus actually during my PhD and after PhD research. We're asking the question, is there any mechanism which could generate the electromagnetic field in the cells, at the solar level, in the radio frequency and microwave spectrum? So when you focus on the band, on the radio frequency up to subterrahertz, so to say, and you do a research and do a review, we did it, uh, well, rather recently, um, there are different hypotheses and theories which predict that uh, which to, to generate electromagnetic field in the cells at the radio frequency and microwave band. Interestingly, most of them are protein-based. All of these are rather, rather specific. Those which are specific, giving some specific predictions, they predict the protein movement and activity brings about the uh, electromagnetic field or electromagnetic fluctuations in this frequency range. This is one of the reasons why we focused on um, asking the questions, could the microtubules, the interesting structures I mentioned earlier, generate electromagnetic field in the cells. So we did quite some theoretical work on this, on this topic, and it's all based on a very simple uh, approach. Imagine, and this is physically completely okay, that any structure has its uh, intrinsic or like eigenfrequencies. It's completely normal, like you have any, organ, any, any object living or living, if you, if you hit it, if it's not damped, it will ring, so it will resonate at a certain eigenfrequency. So we started to ask the question, what are the vibrational eigenfrequencies, vibrational interesting frequencies of the microtubules? Then imagine that something is vibrating. If it carries a charge and it vibrates, it will immediately generate electric fluctuations and in under certain conditions also radiate electromagnetic field. So we combine these two simple physical approaches, uh, mechanical vibrations of the structure and the electric charge of the structure and we calculated the electromagnetic field around it. So, being specific, we calculated first in our couple of papers what are the microtubule eigenmodes and eigenfrequencies. And interestingly, they are in the microwave radio frequency range. Just the eigenmodes here in Waco. Um, this is all based on the knowledge because we, thanks to the crystallographers, we know what is the structure of the tubulin, so we could do all atom simulations of this of uh, eigenmodes of the big structures. We also know, thanks to the knowledge of the structure of the tubulin, what is the electric charge distribution of the tubulin. So we map the charge on these moving eigen eigenmodes of the market tubule, and we could calculate how does the microwave electric field around the market tubule look like, and we published in a couple of the uh, papers in past years. In very short, I just select some uh, results. At one of the papers, which we were like, we asked the question, what if microtubules excited with the several eigenmodes, which is the more realistic state, so the overtones, if you like, the higher, higher modes, not only in the first mode. What we actually observe is something, is a result mathematically of a Fourier transform when it combines several modes, they will form a package or a pulse which propagates along the microtubules. So in the paper, we hypothesized that this kind of exciting excitement that either endogenous excitation or external excitation can make the form, can form a propagating uh, electromechanical mode along the microtubule and we speculated it could serve endogenously for some signaling function in the cell. We also calculated how the electromagnetic field looks like in a dividing cell with some frequency range you can find it in those papers. This is all theory. We are well aware that there are some assumptions which are not verified fully. At first, we do not know so far experimentally what is the real extent of the damping. This is an absolutely crucial question. If, the, if these vibrations would be overdamped, it would have no meaning for biology. We still don't know if it's true or not. Additionally, it is not quite clear how exactly these uh, vibrations can be excited. There are some hypotheses how energy can be transferred from the hydrolysis of GTP and, and mitochondria, but it is still not fully confirmed either. So these are still the open questions. Now, the last part of my talk is um, about the endogenous light emission from my systems. Actually, this is my hard topic which got me to the, to the research in the first place. I can thank to uh, recently this is Fritz Albert Pop, who published a lot of biophotons, bio and actually his first work to bring me to the research in the first place. So, in very briefly, I will go through the topic and what we know so far. Um, so, take that effect, and trust me, this is very reliable results. All organisms emit light. 
When I mean light, I'm speaking about the wavelength range of free, uh, roughly, well, visible range at least, reaching very nearly infrared. By definition, how we understand this phenomenon currently, I'd only tell you the reliable part, there are only many more hypotheses, but what we know so far, this light emission is actually the definition as we understand. Luminescence from biological systems, where the electron excited species are formed due to the oxidation of homogeneous biomolecules. So we know at least that the chemical production, which is due to metabolism, the chemical production of excited states of biomolecules is due to the oxidation. So mechanistically speaking, uh, there are a couple of, mechan uh, couple of pathways which were proved. Five minutes left? Yeah, yeah good. Okay. So uh, we know that uh, there are three pathways that go through dioxetan and um, tetraoxide. These pathways are pretty much strongly studied by the quantum chemists, so it's, this is quite a reliable pathway from a scientific perspective. And we also know that the composition of these intermediate uh, structures intermediate molecules brings about the production of the electronically excited state. So, no external light is needed to produce electronically excited state, which is very interesting. Just due to the metabolic biochemical activity, the excited states are produced. So it's, for me, very fascinating. You get the light not out of nothing, but out of the energy of the system, out of the uh, energy which you have in, in food, so to say, in the organisms. So, uh, speaking wise about the wavelength animation, the intensity of this phenomenon is very low. So that's why often people term it ultra weak photon emission. The term I will use throughout of the uh, by through to this part of the talk. Also, but you can find also other phenomena, other terms like biophotons, body cloud luminescence, weak uh, biochemical luminescence uh, in the literature. I would like to also stress that we are completely certain this is not the phenomenon. This phenomenon is not classical photoluminescence, so neither fluorescent neither phosphorescence. If you leave your system long enough in the darkness, it will still keep on shining, as long as there is oxygen and, and energy to consume in the in the organism. And also, this is not classical bioluminescence because it, the bioluminescence, as we know, the one from the jellyfish and fireflies, requires specific enzymes which are not present in most other organisms. It's also not a thermal radiation because it doesn't, uh, the temperatures of the, of the biological system, so as microscopically do not, are not of the sufficiently high values to, to produce this emission just due to the black body radiation. Okay, now we bring you to the question. So this is very low intensity. I would like to bring you, give you one simple story to understand. This is a very small amount of photons, but can you have a feeling how much is it? Just, is it a lot? Is it little? Probably you know it's ultra big. Let me bring you now to, to this story. So imagine now you are the astronaut on the International Space Station, which is nicely circulating around our Earth. This, imagine now that this astronaut looking through the window of the space station will take a lighter or a candle and will light it up. Well, in the space, it probably look like more like this because there is no gravity or big gravity. So imagine that there is a, this kind of light in the window of the space station. Now this light propagates towards the Earth and this amount of light is roughly, when I calculate it, this amount of photons, just at the edge of the candle flame. Now this light propagates to the Earth, let it be, for example, to Kovne. And this is roughly, depends on the specific place of the station, 440 kilometers. Do you have any idea how many photons, because this light propagates in all directions, so it's, it gets diluted as it propagates, so intensity of the light decreases. Do you know how many photons reach the level of the Kovne? or ever in the Earth? Probably you think it's a small number. So I put two question marks here because it's roughly when you calculate, make simple calculations, only 60 photons per centimeter square per second. So this is very little amount of the, of the light. You can imagine it's, this, is, this is light. So basically what I'm trying to say is that the amount of light which organisms emit and we can detect is roughly equivalent to the, as you are looking on a can, to the candlelight on from the International Space Station when you are on the surface of the Earth. So very low light. This is, is this measurable at all? Yes. And it's thanks to the technology being developed developed over the world, but especially in Japan, I can I have to think one of the strongest companies to do so is uh, Hamamatsu Photonics. We use many devices from them. So I have to thank the to, to Japanese engineers and physicists for these developments. And there are two ways, as I mentioned. We can either image these weak signals or we can we just count, count the total amount of light. 
So at first I mentioned we can also we can image the signals. For example, this is the hands of the of the human, and this is the endogenous signals, these alternate photon emission from the human hands. Just to give you an idea how these uh, how these images look like. But also, we can, as I mentioned, you can not only make images, but for a fast measurement, an easier measurement, and cheaper measurement, you can just buy photomultiplier tubes. For example, those from Hamatsu, but also from electron tubes. The UK producer can work. And then you can, what you get is just the signals in time and intensity of the light you detect. And there are some pros and cons of these approaches. Um, what we know so far, we, were, we are as a physicist, we are asking what are the... Yeah, I will be finished. Okay, okay. It's just few slides. We are asking what are the emitting species and the color of the light to detect. So, by the color of light, we can do this simply by spectroscopy. And we're asking questions, why is this color the color we measure? What is, what is it bringing about? So in the go to the molecular approach, we know that there are certain species which are electronically excited, which are produced in the organisms. And these are triple carbonyls, single excited pigments. And also these are other species which are proposed to emit. They are known from the chemical systems, but not fully confirmed in organisms. So this basically brings about uh, the answer to the question, why is this light in a visible range? What to which molecular species does it correspond? You can find more details in our recent papers. Just to briefly overview what this phenomenon is telling us, we found that ultra photon emission can be related to the metabolism. Here we start to grow the yeast cells. Uh, when we when they uh, consume all the energy, then we can replenish the energy and they start to shine again. So this is the time intensity during the growth of the yeast cells. We also found that the ultra photon emission can be related to the using metabolomics to the oxidative products. So there is a relation, strong relation to the oxidation, which I mentioned. We also found demonstrated on the plant system that when we exogenously add oxidants as a stress, we increase the slide signals. And in the current paper we are preparing, we also show that on the on the human hand, human skin, we can of course measure the endogenous signals, ultra photon emission, and also when we cause stress, which is otherwise not visible by naked eye, you can see with the sensitive detectors that the skin emits light depending on stress. We can suppress this stress by the antioxidants, then the light intensity decreases. So to finalize my talk, I would like to give you a couple of take-home messages. One is that uh, we, um, we know that the molecular dynamic simulations are quite powerful because they have an understanding of the complex permittivity of biosamples. It includes very nicely, you can see the interaction of biomolecules with the water, and it goes beyond the microwaves to the, to the terahertz as well, these methods. And also it enables us to understand the electric field effects of the molecular scale. Furthermore, uh, our technology enables us to uh, basically design and develop microstructure chips, which bring knowledge uh, about the uh, dielectric properties of samples which otherwise couldn't be measured. And also these chips, which I didn't mention today, enable us to probe the electric field, electromagnetic field by effects using advanced microscopies because they are compatible with the uh, special, special microscopes, advanced microscopes. And in the end, last but not least, uh, I've shown that organisms emit ultraviolet light which reflects oxidative processes, which has a potential for using biomedical diagnostics. And with this, I would like to thank you for your attention. I'm glad to take questions. Any questions? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for your nice presentation. Any question? Uh, have you tried to, to measure uh, weak emissions from water? Yes. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't mean to put that. Yeah. Well, what is the spectrum? Um, water itself, you do not see any emission. If if it's just pure water and there is no oxidative processes, we have to do something to do to the water to induce it. But that's not in the genius anymore. You have, there is supposed to be some. Uh, yeah, it's maybe the limitation of the method, but we don't see emission from the pure water only. We have to do. There has to be some metabolism going on, so there has to be an organism which is present. Well, this is very important. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if you, if you introduce some perturbations to the water, I mean, it, it's not, uh, not other molecules because of the metabolism is related to other metabolic um, molecules, so I can understand that. But if you have water at a different temperature, for example, you will see probably 
I, I'm saying it's just maybe limitation of the detection methods. To be honest, completely, of course, there are some limitations I didn't have time to mention. For example, if the sample is very small, like just several cells, you will measure nothing. So it might be the same case. You might need to have a sample large enough to get you know, photons. So that's maybe the reason when we have only the dish with, let's say, three milliliters of the buffer. <coughs> for us, it's just the same as a dark round of the photo multiplier. But it's, you know, it's not proving there is no emission, we just don't see any, right? Okay. So it's actually, I have to be fair to say that. Thank you. Well, actually, I'm going to um, continue on that. Um, I saw that on one slide you did not comment on that, but um, you said that uh, at 12, uh, 17 nanometers, you saw uh, actually that um, uh, sink it to oxygen. And we saw uh, the same things and, uh, in plants uh, when they were actually in this resurrection plants when they react to this oxidative stress. But uh, in relation, very, very close to this band, there are several water bands that are also um, uh, so, sort of like involved with oxidative stress. So, so <laughs> I was just, um, how did you, uh, what was the purpose of this slide, of, of mentioning this signal of oxygen? These are the species which are known to be, all of these in uh, chemical, so chemical models can be produced in excited state just through the chemistry. So these are the known emitters. Uh, these are, and when I, I, these are in the italics because they're only improved rigorously in the chemical systems. The other two were, were proved not only in chemical models but also in biological systems, just to distinguish. But basically, these are all the emitters, the species which are known to emit the photons in, within this phenomenon. So, this is the purpose of the slide, just basically showing the emitters and the energy. Transfer between the, between the so this is no. <laughs> okay. Yeah, this is no. Yeah. But yeah. only in the chemical systems, which are models of the biological systems. In the <coughs> thank you. <coughs> Last question. Uh, thank you so much for your very nice presentation. Uh, just a comment. Uh, I'm here. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Um, in reference to the fact that you were wondering if uh, such a microwave range uh, signals, in the sense modes uh, that you simulated in microtubers, could uh, be um, um, could have a biological significance in dependence of if whether they are damped or not. Uh, I think that uh, they they do have a, a biological significance because if we think that the cellular ambient environment is. Uh, <coughs> let's say filled with interfacial water that uh, is a super coherent characteristics uh, as also Larissa Brinzig has shown I think that uh, you have uh, at least uh, the formation of, uh, for the nonlinear coverings um, of uh, between medium and the, the wave we can have an anomalous dispersion uh, optical care effect so you have the creation of or stationary waves or solitons that can propagate and choose some preferential way of uh, traveling and uh, I think, uh, congratulations for it, but I think that you, you are correct to be careful and but I, I think indeed that the, you will discover that they do have. Maybe I, I hope <laughs> thank so. You thank you so much. much. Yeah, thank you very much. I think there are many, op there are many theoretical hypothetical possibilities which could argue for reduced damping because this is a major yeah. question. If you ask 95% of biophysicists, the ordinary scientists biophysicists, yeah, yeah. tell you yes. this is all damped. This is a crucial question. It's related to the volume partially. But I mean, I'm careful because unless I see the experiment is convincing, I don't no, want to no. tell you it's the case. I understand. Thank you. Thank you to our speaker. Thank you.